good morning good morning to our friends who have just joined us on social media and uh, our household we greet you and this morning i just want to uh, uh, speak about the source of peace you know we are just uh, after today we are just two sundays away before christmas and one of the things that god brought to us in the birth of jesus was peace so turn with me to scripture. We're going to look at a few scriptures today. And I want to start with John chapter 14, verse 27. John chapter 14, verse 27. Scripture says, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor fearful. This is a passage, my friends, which speaks ever so warmly, yet forcibly to the needs of men. It covers the source of peace. The source of peace. Now, peace in the Greek, erene, erene means to bind together, erene. That means to bind together to join, to weave together. It means that a person is bound, woven, and joined together with himself and with God and with others. Obviously, the Hebrew word is shalom. It means freedom from trouble and much more. It means experiencing the highest good, enjoying the very best, Possessing all the inner good possible. It means wholeness and soundness. It means prosperity in the widest sense. Especially prosperity in the spiritual sense of having a soul that blossoms and flourishes. First we see in verse 27 again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor fearful. The first point I want to make is this. There is the peace of the world. This is a piece of escapism. Of, it's a piece of avoiding trouble. It's a piece, it's a kind of piece of refusing to face things. It's a kind of piece of unreality. It is a peace that is sought through pleasure, satisfaction, contentment, the absence of trouble, positive thinking, or the denial of problems. The second kind of peace we see is that there is a peace of Christ and of God. This is first a bosom peace, a peace deep within. It is a tranquility of mind, a composure, a peace that is calm in the face of bad circumstances and situations. It is more than feelings, even more than attitude and thought. This is, secondly, the peace of conquest. So first is a Boston peace, and second is the peace of conquest. It is the peace independent of conditions and environment. The peace which no sorrow, no danger, no suffering, no experience can take away. In John 16, 33, John chapter 16, verse 33, this is what Jesus says. These things are spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. The third kind of peace is the peace of assurance. It is the peace of unquestionable confidence. The peace with a sure knowledge that one's life is in the hands of God and that all things will work out for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8 verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. The word of God says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called 
according to his purpose. This is the fourth kind of peace that God gives us. The peace of intimacy with God. It is the peace of the highest good. It is the peace that settles the mind, strengthens the will, and establishes the heart. My friends, I gave you two points earlier. There's the peace of the world, and there's the peace of Christ and of God. Thirdly, we see that the scripture tells us about the source of peace. I want you to understand, peace is always born out of reconciliation. Its source, the source of peace is only found in the reconciliation brought by Jesus Christ. Peace always had to do with personal relationships. A man's relationship to himself, a man's relationship to God, a man's relationship to his fellow men. A man must be bound, woven and joined together with himself, with God and with his fellow men. Let me give you a scripture reference for that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. My friends, how do we then secure peace? We secure peace in the following manner. Firstly, we secure peace by justification. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, we secure peace by loving God's word. We secure peace by loving God's word. Psalm 119 Verse 165. Psalm 119, verse 165 says, Those who love your law have great peace, and nothing causes, causes them to stumble. Thirdly, man secures peace by praying about everything. Pray about everything, and you will have peace, my friends. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your heart or let your request be made known to God. Verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Fourthly, we secure peace by being spiritually minded. We secure peace by being spiritually minded. Romans 8 verse 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Number five, we secure peace by staying our minds upon God. We secure peace by, I, I would like to use this word, by keeping our minds upon God. Isaiah 26 verse 3. The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. Number six, man secures peace by keeping God's commandments. Philippians 4 verse 9. For the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. The subject of peace is often divided into three categories. Firstly, we have peace with God, peace with God, which is brought through salvation. Then secondly, you have the peace of God, which is the very peace of God himself, and which points to God as the source of peace. And we have thirdly, the peace from God, which God gives to dwell in the heart of the believer as we walk day by day in the Lord. Now, I want to look at the first one, which is the peace with God, which is brought through salvation. And for that, I want us to turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Scripture says, 
Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, man is blessed by God through justification. Blessed beyond all imagination. Justification and its results are gloriously covered in this passage of Scripture. Justification in the Greek, when you look at the word in the Greek, it means to count someone righteous. It means to reckon, to credit, to account, to judge, to treat, to look upon as righteous. It does not mean to make a man righteous. I want you to, 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 to understand this. The Greek word used is diokinion. Diokinion. And all Greek words which end in O-U-N, on, mean not to make someone something, but merely to count, basically is to judge or to treat someone as something. Now, there are three major points to note about justification. Firstly, why is justification necessary? Justification is necessary because of the sin and alienation of men. Remember, man rebelled against God, and man has taken his life into his own hands. Man lives as he desires, and he desires it, and, and all his desires are basically to fulfill the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, and clinging to the pride of life and to the things of the world. Man has become sinful and ungodly. Man has become an enemy of God pushing God out of his life and wanting little, if anything, to do with God. Man has separated and alienated himself from God. Secondly, justification is necessary because of the anger and wrath of God. God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 7.11 tells us that. Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. Sin has aroused God's anger and wrath. God is angry over man's rebellion. God is angry over man's ungodliness. God is angry over man's sin, hostility, unrighteousness. Man has turned his back upon God, putting God away and having little to do with him. Man has not made God the center of his life. Man has broken his relationship with God. Therefore, the greatest need in man's life is to discover the answer to the question. How can the relationship between man and God be restored? The second point I want to make is this. God justifies a man because of his son Jesus Christ. When a man believes in Jesus Christ, God takes that man's faith <clears throat> sorry, and counts it as righteousness. The man is not righteous, but God considers, God credits the man's faith as righteousness. And why is God willing to do this? Firstly, God is willing to justify man because God loves man that much. God loves man so much that he sent his son into the world and sacrificed his son in order to justify man. Secondly, God is willing to justify man because of what his son Jesus has done for man. Remember, Jesus Christ has secured the ideal righteousness for man. He came to earth to live a sinless and perfect life. As man, he never broke the law of God. He never went contrary to the will of God, not even once. Therefore, he stood before God and before the world as the ideal man, the perfect man, the representative man, the perfect righteousness that could stand for the righteousness of every man. Jesus Christ came into the world to die for men. As the ideal man, he could take all the sins of the world upon himself and, <clears throat> and die for every man. His death could stand for every man. He exchanged places with man and by, be, by, by becoming a sinner. 2 Corinthians 5.19 tells us that. He bore the wrath of God against sin, bearing the condemnation for every man. Again, he was able to do this because he was the ideal man. 
And as the idle man, his death could stand for the death of every man. Jesus Christ came into the world to arise from the dead and thereby to conquer death for men. As the idle man, his resurrection and exaltation into the presence of God could stand for every man's desperate need to conquer death and to be acceptable to God. His resurrected life could stand for the resurrected life of the believer. Now, as I said earlier, when a man believes in Jesus Christ, that means really believes, God takes that man's belief. God takes that man's belief and number one, counts it as the righteousness, as the perfection of Christ. That man is counted as righteous in Christ. Secondly, God takes that man's belief and counts it as the death of Christ. The man is counted as having already died in Christ, as having already paid the penalty for sin in the death of Christ. Thirdly, God takes that man's faith, that man's belief, and counts it as the resurrection of Christ. The man is counted as already having been resurrected in Christ. Very simply put is this, my friends. God loves his son, Jesus Christ, so much that he honors any man who honors his son by believing on him. He honors the man by taking the man's faith and counting it as righteousness and by giving him the glorious privilege of living with Christ forever in the presence of God. The third point is this. How does God justify a man? The word justify is a legal word taken from the courts. It pictures man on trial before God. Man is seen as having committed the most serious of crimes. He has rebelled against God. He has broken his relationship with God. How can he restore that relationship? Now within human courts, if a man is acquitted, he is declared innocent. But this is not true with the divine court. When a man appears before God, he is anything but innocent. He is utterly guilty and condemned accordingly. But when a man sincerely trusts Christ, then God takes that man's faith and counts it as righteousness. By such, God counts the man, judges him and treats him as if he was innocent. The man is not made innocent. He is guilty. He knows it and God knows it. But God treats him as innocent. God justifies the ungodly. An incredible mercy. A wondrous grace. So how do you and I know this this morning, my friends? How can we know for sure that God is like this? Well, very simply, I can tell you this. Because Jesus said so. He said that God loves us. We are sinners, yes. But Christ said that we are very, very dear to God. Genesis 15 verse 6. Genesis 15 verse 6 says, And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. 1 Corinthians 6.11 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I just want to go back to Romans chapter 5, verse 1, where it says that therefore being justified by faith, we have peace. I had to explain what justification is in order to come into this area of peace. Our message is still entitled the source of peace. The first result of justification is peace with God. Right? Now, the first point I want to make is this. The meaning of peace with God is striking. Peace with God doesn't mean uh, an escape route. It doesn't mean a quiet atmosphere. It doesn't mean the absence of trouble. It doesn't mean the control of situations by positive thinking or denying the problem or the ability to keep from facing reality. Peace with God means the sense and knowledge that one has restored his relationship with God. Peace with God means the sense and knowledge that one is no longer alienated and separated from God. Peace with God means the sense and knowledge that one is now reconciled 
with God. That one now is accepted by God. That one now is freed from the wrath and judgment of God. Peace with God means the sense and knowledge that one is freed from fearing God's wrath and judgment. That one is now pleasing God. That one is now at peace with God. Second point I want to make is this. The source of peace is Jesus Christ. Man can have peace with God only because of Jesus Christ. It is he who reconciles men to God. He has made peace by the blood of his cross. Let me give you a scripture reference. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 to 15. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 14 to 15. Scripture says, For he is our peace who had made both one and had broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of, of commandments contained in ordinances, but to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. The third point I want to make is this. The reason we have peace in the glorious truth is the glorious truth of justification. The second point, the peace of God, which is the very peace of God himself and which points to God at the source of, as the source of peace. My friends, let me repeat that. The peace of God, which is the very peace of God himself and which points to God as a source of peace. Let me get into another scripture. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. My friends, once we have made peace with God, then the peace of God floods our lives. So how do we maintain that peace? How do we keep the peace of God ruling and reigning within our souls? How do we keep a consciousness of God, of God's very own presence within us? How do we keep an awareness that the God of peace lives within our very being? So this short passage discusses two of the most important steps to possessing peace. Above all the other passages, it tells us how to have peace and how to maintain peace. And if we will take these two steps, the peace of God will rule and reign in our hearts and lives. We will never lose our peace or be without peace. Firstly, or not firstly, I want you to understand peace comes through prayer. And I want you to note three significant points. Peace comes through prayer. And three points to that. Number one, there is the charge. Be anxious about nothing. Be anxious about nothing. The idea is that the believer is not to worry. The believer is not to fret about a single thing. The word nothing in the Greek means not even one thing you have to worry about. Humanly speaking, the Philippians had every reason to worry and to be anxious. Why do we say that? If you read Philippians chapter 1 to chapter 4, Basically, we find that they were suffering severe persecution. They were facing a disturbance in the church, some disunity and quarreling. They had some carnal members within their fellowship, some members who were prideful, super spiritual and self-centered. They were facing some false teachers who had joined their fellowship and the teachers were fierce in attacking the cross of Christ. And some of the believers were having to struggle for the necessities of life, food, clothing, and shelter. So there was little else that could confront these dear believers. They were facing about every trial and every temptation imaginable, the kind of trouble that arouses anxiety and worry. Humanly, a person is going to fret, he's going to worry, he's going to suffer anxiety. Right? You and I, we are going to fret, we are going to worry and suffer anxiety when we are either about to lose or we lack food, clothing, and shelter. We are going to start to fret, worry, and suffer anxiety when we are persecuted, 
when we are ridiculed, when we are abused and threatened. We are going to fret, worry and suffer when we are surrounded by quarrels and disturbances and carnality and false teachings. But I want you to understand today, we are not the world. We belong to the kingdom. Because we see that in the midst of such circumstances, the only way a person can keep from warring is to receive an injection of supernatural power. And this is the very point of the scripture. There is an answer to worry and anxiety. A supernatural answer, which is the peace of God. God will enable us to conquer worry and anxiety. God will overcome the trials of life for the believer. No matter how terrible, no matter how pressuring they may be. God will infuse the believer with peace. The very peace of God himself. A peace so great and so wonderful that he carries the believer right through the trial. Of course, this does not mean the believer is not to be concerned about the problems of life. He is. But there's a difference between concern and anxiety or worry. Concern drives us to arise and tackle the problems of life with a certain courage and diligence. Concern drives us to tackle and conquer all that we can handle. Anxiety and worry cause all kinds of problems. What kinds of problems does anxiety and worry cause? Fear to act, or sometimes they might be, might be quick and, 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 and uh, start activating unplanned actions, or we might withdraw, we make unwise and harmful decisions, hesitations, when we allow anxiety and worry to come into us, we, we come into a place of cowardice, physical sickness and infirmities can come in, emotional problems, depression, spiritual backsliding, discouragement, distrust and unbelief, and a defeated attitude. Of course, the list can go on and on, my friends, but a point to see is the seriousness of anxiety and worry. Just take a moment and think about a few of the above problems. How anxiety and worry causes a person to act and suffer. And the seriousness is easily seen. We all know people who suffer greatly because of anxiety and worry. They simply lack the peace of God. Yet the charge of scripture is forceful. The scripture says, be anxious for nothing. Not even for a single thing. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 33. Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles, the unbelievers, seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. The second point I want to make is this. The remedy for anxiety and worry is prayer. The remedy for anxiety and worry is prayer. The four words used for prayer show exactly how prayer is the answer to anxiety and worry. Now, in the Greek, there are four words, right? Firstly, the word prayer. In the Greek, refers to the special times of prayer that we share in periods of devotion and worship. We are to have set times for prayer, times that we especially set aside for devotion and worship. Secondly, the word supplication. In the Greek, it refers to the prayers that focus upon special needs. That means we feel a deep, intense need. Therefore, we go before God and supplicate. That is, pour out our soul to God. Because there is a need, a great need that confronts us. And the only possible help and deliverance is God. Therefore, we come and lay our need before him as a child, crying and pleading and begging for his help. For his, begging for his comfort, begging for his deliverance and peace. The word thanksgiving means that we thank and praise God for all that he is 
for all that he has done for us. And the word request means specific and definite request. Our prayer is not to be general, but specific. We are to lay before God exactly what is needed. And, and we are not to fear that we are being too detailed with God or bothering God. Neither we are to hold back from asking because we fear he will not answer something so specific. Too often believers fear not receiving the answer to a specific request. Fear that it will show how weak they are spiritually if the request is not granted. But what scripture says in everything, in everything, pray like this. Use all four ways of praying and use them in praying for everything. Now this means two things. Firstly, we are to walk in God. That means we live, move, and have our beings in Him. And we do this by prayer. We live and move in God through prayer. We pray in everything, all day long, as we walk and move about our daily affairs. We pray in times that are specifically set aside for devotion and worship. We supplicate, that is, we struggle in prayer when facing times of deep, intense need. Uh, then we offer thanksgiving and praise all day long as we walk and move about. Then, fourthly, we offer our requests, specific requests to God. We ask Him to do definite things uh, uh, as we walk throughout the day. As I said earlier, we walk in God. That means we live, move, and have our being in Him. And the way we do this is through prayer. The second note I want you to note is this. We are to pray about everything, no matter how small and insignificant it may seem. God is interested in the details of our lives, my friends. In the most minute details. He wants us acknowledging him in all our ways or steps because he wants to care and look after every single step. I want you to picture the scene. We are walking throughout the day. We are sharing with God every step of the way. And God is taking care of every step of the way. What then can take the peace of God away from us? Absolutely nothing. For as we walk in prayer and fellowship with God, God is infusing us with his presence. He's infusing us with his peace. No matter the conflict or no matter the trial, we are continuing to share with God and God is continuing to infuse us with his peace. Through prayer, he is giving us the peace to conquer. Through prayer, he is giving us the peace to walk through that trial. Our relationship with God and his peace is unbroken. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 says pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And thirdly the promise. When we do these things there is a promise and the promise is peace. Now as I told you earlier the word peace in the, in, in the Greek means to be bound, to be joined and woven together. It means to be assured, to be confident and secure in the love and care of God. It means to have a sense, to have a consciousness, a knowledge that God will provide, God will deliver, God will guide, God will encourage, God will strengthen, God will save, God will sustain, God will give real life both now and forever. A person can experience the peace of God only as he walks and moves about in prayer. And this is important because only God can deliver man through the most severe circumstances, the most severe tragedies of life. Only God can infuse assurance and security within the human soul. The wonderful promise about the peace of God is twofold. Firstly, the peace of God passes all understanding. It is beyond anything we can ask or think. It surpasses all our imagination. Think of the most terrible situations you can imagine. Then think of the peace you would want as you went through that trial. In actual experience, the peace of God is far greater than anything you could ever imagine or understand. The peace of God actually carries the faithful believer through the very midst of trial and tribulation. Second, the peace of God keeps our hearts and minds. The word shall keep is a military word meaning to garrison, to keep guard, to protect. 
The peace of God is like a most elite soldier who guards and protects the most precious possessions of God, the believer's heart and mind. However, again, please note that God keeps us only as we are in Christ Jesus. We can know the peace of God only if we have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior and only if we walk in fellowship with him. To be in Christ means to walk in Christ, to live, to move, and to have our beings in him. John 14, verse 27. John 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your heart, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And thirdly, the peace from God, which God gives to dwell in the hearts of the believer as he walks day by day in the Lord. The peace from God, which God gives to dwell in the heart of the believer as he walks day by day in the Lord. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, I want you to take note this morning. Peace is the result or the fruit of God's favor. Peace with God and peace with men. When a man receives the grace of God, he is immediately reconciled to God and men. He is given fellowship with God and a love for all other men. But I want you to note and remember this morning that peace comes only from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the only source of peace. If a man wishes to have the peace of God ringing in his heart and life, he has to come to God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Loving Father, thank you that we have peace with you. And we are now your children and have your perfect peace in our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that Christ is our peace, our wonderful peace, whose spirit is forever dwelling within us. May we share abroad his wonderful peace to all we meet from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My friends, as we prepare ourselves for the great celebration of Christmas this year, in, two, in, in about two to three weeks' time, my prayer is that you meditate on the word of God to see how the peace of God gives us victory. To our friends on social media, thank you for joining us. We'll meet you all again next week. Have a blessed week. To our household, to our family and our household, please hold on and we'll continue with our service. God bless you.